Hi everybody, this is Bruce with Lebowski Studio and in this video I'm going to go over several things that I do in the studio and also while I'm out driving around for some plein air paintings about how to uh, keep things organized and other tips. So thank you for joining me and let's get started. Okay, we're going to start with a little tour of the studio and this is a uh, after you come up the stairs, this is the room that I paint in most of the time, like 90% of the time. I'm just going to do a little pan shot here. And for this video, yes, I was going to neaten it up and try to tidy up, but let's be realistic. Artists in their little creative uh, space in their mind when they're working, uh, things get a little messy. And this is typically kind of how disorganized it may be but it still works enough for me. And we're gonna go over here. This is the main little area. You can see I have my chair. And this whole studio, it's on the third floor, so you have all these angled ceilings going on. Because in an ideal world, I would love to have like a nice studio easel that can accept, you know, a six foot painting or, but the mast of the easel would be poking into the ceiling. So just gotta make it work. I'm happy to have the space. So this, like I said, is the main work area. And all I did, rather than set up an easel that would take up a footprint on the floor, I just nailed some two by fours together, stuck a piece of plywood on there, and created a little easel that leans up against my work table and that work table's not there, it'll wedge right up against the ceiling. And if I wanted to work from a photo or needed some little detail information, I have my an older computer that we have uh, hooked up. And with my photos that I take for subject matter sometimes. And so that's the main painting area. And then also when I, I added some railing all around the room to prop up paintings in progress to dry that sort of thing and of course you got to have some music so there's my little radio and I can also plug in my phone with a little cord to uh, play music off the phone here is sorry the lights catching up some more little sh shelving that I put up for paintings and all these are on panels most of them probably 95 percent of them but you can see I just use like little, I don't know, it must be one and a quarter pine strips, nail them to the wall, and I just put this little strip of poster board, a stiff board, you can use wood, I just didn't feel like it, to hold the panel up there so it doesn't slip off. Now, we're going to go into the room where I'll sometimes shoot photos of my artwork. If it's, uh, I need to get pictures done and it's rainy out or that sort of thing. And over here, several years back, I built two by four construction. This is where I store paintings, uh, blank canvases, that sort of stuff. And uh, as you can see, I got some out that I'm thinking of reworking. And as I said, there's my photography lights. I also have the little umbrellas that reflect the light that hook on. Then over here is the board where I will put the painting and set up the camera and that sort of thing with taking pictures. And what I did on this board is I'm already pre-marked off certain sizes. I don't know if the camera's picking that up. So I know right where to put it in relation to the camera as I set it up. So I don't have to keep moving the camera. And I do that by taking these rails. They have dowels in them that will then insert into those holes, those lighter little holes you see, at the different areas to photograph the artwork. And it works pretty good. Okay, in the last room... This is just kind of a catch-all. I have 
my bookcases along that little wasted space because what it's kind of what else are you going to do with it? Uh, there's the painting I just finished. 16 by 20. So all my art books and art magazines over there in the corner. Love my art books. With me for life. Got some good ones in there. And what I've done is I made this shadow box type thing to do my still life painting in. And I'm just going to turn the light on. So this light is a dimmer bulb and it has, get it down here, it has this thing with it to increase the brightness or turn it off. So you can adjust the strength of the light on your still life, which is super nice. So to give you an idea, just put a can there here. And I sit in my little chair, I set up the easel, and that's the view I would paint from. So you get the nice little ledge. And of course you can change the fabrics out, add, you know, whatever you want in there. But this is what I painted a uh, steel pot, the pot with uh, re the reflections video with the pot and potatoes. And that's what I did in it. And I got this idea from a YouTube channel called Draw Mix Paint. It's probably not, I mean, it's, you know, he gives you, tells you how to make it. It's really not a big deal, just making a box, essentially. I actually just made a, a frame of two by fours and screwed on some cardboard, thick cardboard, to create the walls. And this piece is a cardboard to control amount of light coming in from ambient light and also uh, to control light on your subject matter. And then I just have a big piece of cardboard, so when I do go to paint, to block the light coming from the window and this little piece of wood in the front uh, wood and cardboard kind of helps deflect some of the ambient light coming from my uh, easel that I'll have light on and that sort of thing. It works really well. Uh, so you just have to be a little careful if you have a highly reflective surface uh, like glass or whatever from lights behind you reflecting in. But if you don't mind that um, so this is my studio space and now I'm going to go over the paperwork things that I use to organize my, uh, my paintings and all that sort of thing. Okay, now we're going to go over some of the, I call it the paperwork trail that I use to document my artwork. Uh, because I always take photos and of course people take photos put on their websites and that sort of thing but I, I go to pretty good lengths to keep track of what's going on with artwork you know um, so we're gonna start now first with uh, what I would use if I'm sending paintings say to a gallery or maybe you have the opportunity to do a show at a local coffee shop whatever one of the things that's handy because maybe they need a list for insurance purposes it doesn't matter it's just a very handy th thing to have. And you can create this in your computer. I use Publisher to create, uh, just make a document. You can create like a little grid, like a spreadsheet grid. And depending on what information you want in there, how many columns and uh, columns and rows. Uh, so what I've created is what I call, again, I hope this doesn't turn into reverse on when I edit this stuff, which would be too bad, but you'll probably still be able to see the layout. It's called an inventory list. And I'm going to try to hold it really still. One of these days I'll figure out maybe how to connect in editing uh, to so you can download the form or something. But you can create these. So let me zoom in. And I got my name, address at the top. And then uh, I'm just going to pan this a little bit and then I'm going to tell you the topics that I have covered in it. The subjects, I should say. Okay, hopefully that's enough. Let me know if it's not. I'm going to go over 
couple of the lines, of course, I have the shipped slash delivered to, the date that I did that, and the method of shipment. Also, I have an exhibit uh, line for exhibition title, the exhibition dates, a line for the gallery commission percentage, and then for the actual grid part, see how that I have the title, medium, size, price, what's due me, due artist I put, if it was paid, OS for outstanding, RET for returned. So maybe you might pick up, maybe you have a show and you pick up some of the paintings or, you know, just something to keep track of uh, activity. So I hope that helps you. Uh, I have found it super, super useful and I'm glad I did this. So it keeps you very organized. Now we're going to go on to the next thing. Okay, now on to keeping track. Uh, again, uh, this is mostly like if, if you have a gallery affiliation. Uh, if you don't at the moment, it obviously might not be very useful, but I'll go ahead and explain it. I keep a notebook on each gallery I'm with, which is only two at the moment, but you know, that can fluctuate over time. And in the front, this notebook has like a pocket on the front and I suck a sheet in there with contact information for that gallery. And uh, when I, st their commission percentage, when I started uh, being represented by them, so I have a, at a glance, kind of a history there. And then you open this up and you have those sheets right here. I'm going to hold up close to the camera here. I'm going to hold it close to the camera and have you take a look. In that notebook, I keep what I call a master inventory sheet that documents the paintings I have at that establishment. And when I've picked them up, when they've been returned, and basic information. At the top you have the year and of course the uh, gallery. Then you have the date sent, work number, we'll get to that in the next little segment here. Title of the painting, size, price, at the commission, which I never really use that column but I just stuck it in there. And then when it was sold. And uh, or if I go and pick them up, maybe they've been there a while and I'm trading out work, I'll just write in that, in that comment area, uh, R-E-T for return and, and the date that it was returned. So, that this book has been very useful because maybe you have a painting that's coming from another gallery or another location. You don't know if you've sent it to, to, to the gallery you're going to be sending to. This is a snapshot of what you've sent to that gallery over the years. Very useful so you don't have the embarrassing thing of like, Hey, I got this painting. I mean, just because it's an older work doesn't mean it's been seen a lot. So you may want to send it to them, and it's going to prevent you from double sending a painting, which can be super embarrassing. So I hope that helps. Now we're going to go on to uh, the segment that covers this work number. Okay, so what I do is when I do a painting and I finish that painting, I log onto the back of that painting certain information that I then put into my log book so that I can keep track. That is like the master file of my paintings that I've done for, I mean, I've been doing it for many years. And uh, what that looks like is I'll finish a painting. I had a video on this earlier in my YouTube when it first started. And I don't have the work number assigned yet, which I, so I signed the work number. So this will be, I think I'm up to 703 now or something. Then the title of the painting, month completed, and 
description, oil on canvas, mounted on panel. I signed the painting and then I print my name and any other information like palette used or painted on location, that kind of uh, uh, information. So in this particular piece, I don't have it numbered yet, even though I have da I've dated it because I just want to keep it dated because I haven't sent it out anywhere yet. And uh, so that's why. Normally it would have a number there. So now what I do is this is the Bible. And normally, like I have to get another binder and split this up a little bit. It's getting a little fat. But uh, what causes that is, I'll show you. Hold on one second. Get a page out of here so I can talk about it. Here's what the page looks like. And again, you can create this in Publisher. I'm going to pan up on this a little bit. So there's some of the information. And I'm going to read some of the lines. So as you see, when I take a photo of the painting, I'll go on my computer and I'll print out just one of the, I'll print out a little tiny photo, just stick in the book so there's a visual identifier. And we have the title, size, year, completed, like July 2016. Medium, I put codes, O slash P for oil and panel. Price, description, I'll sometimes list in there. I usually do. This one I haven't yet. And then this is the palette. Of colors that I mostly use and I used to if it's a really distinctive painting with certain palette I'll circle that I've kind of gotten out of that habit I don't really get into that too much but it's nice to have it there when I want it then you have materials like if it's canvas or panel and what it was varnished with what kind of varnish maybe that might be useful for down the road if you want to do uh, revarnish or something like that uh, Lines for exhibition, so you know which exhibition it's been in. Any prizes won. And owners, if you get that information, you write the owner's uh, information on that line. So very, very useful. And, uh, of course, the book gets so fat because all these are on the same side of the page. Would be nice to design the form so there's alternating... You know, kind of, so the pages end up being more even, but that's that's a tiny little problem. So that is how I keep track of my artwork. So once you know, I write that in the book, and I decide I'm going to send certain paintings to a, uh, a gallery. That's when I go to my uh, little inventory list, write that down, send it to the gallery, and then whatever gallery it is, I'll go to the uh, gallery book. And I'll uh, fill that out so I get every, there's many references that I can use over time to find out information about the history of one of my paintings. So hope you found it useful and uh, that's it for the paperwork. Okay, another idea that I've uh, been using lately, I don't know why I haven't thought about it sooner over the years of driving around, but what I like to do, especially on nice days, is uh, I just go driving around. I get a lot of ideas for paintings that way and uh, other ideas, and it's very relaxing. Uh, you know, usually might go out for an hour, mostly within a 20-mile radius of where I live. And what happens sometimes is maybe I go somewhere and I do a painting. You know, I paint on site, do the painting, and on the drive home, and I got to get home, something, you know, maybe I have to go to work, whatever. Uh, you'll see another scene and you're like, oh, wow, that's perfect. And, and then, you know, maybe I'll remember to come back and do that. Well, those perfect scenarios kind of disappeared quickly. You know, one day it turns into another, and by the time you get back there, it's a month later. And of course, the lights changed in terms of the uh, sun in the sky. So it's not quite exactly perfect. Well, what I started doing, and I've always had this little book in my car because when I get other ideas like for 
maybe an idea for a show, an idea for a painting title, I would write it in this, these little books that you can buy anywhere in an office supply store. And what I'm doing now is when I pass a location that I can't just paint right then, I'll stop and write down the plein air location. I'm going to see if, how much this uh, zooms in here so you can kind of see. Let me try to do it slow so that you know, let's see what happens. And I don't know, showing reverse of my camera. I'm not sure how this is going to work, but what I've done is I write down where I'm at. Uh, you, I've been around my area, you know, like 20 miles circumference here so many times that I can just write down the road and I'll, I'll instantly know the location because I'll, I'll uh, just know it from previous trips and st such. But if you're in a little location you're not used to, of course, you write down like Route 32, take a left at whatever intersection and second house on the left is blue right near there. That kind of whatever details you need to remember. But I write that and specifically I'll write the time the month and because uh, the month is going to be important because of course the lights different in the sky and different seasons so that will definitely help you uh, achieve uh, and of course the weather conditions like if it's super sunny or maybe a particularly cloudy day it it really looked interesting to paint on a cloudy day so get one of these and start doing that because some days I'll want to go out and paint and I just feel like getting outside to paint, and I'm like, oh, where, you know, you know, I'll look at the weather conditions and go, hmm, let me get my little book and see what I wrote down, and then I'll go to that location. And what's interesting about the time is, say you put 9 o'clock sunny in October, uh, that can also help you, uh, you know, and it might say, you know, blue house with trim or hay fields, whatever, whatever you need to detail it out, but... That'll also give you time to get there just a little bit early so you're set up for that moment. So that you're not getting there at 9 again because uh, I think that'll help save a little, you know, you'll be all ready to go. To, uh, you'll have your drawing done because the drawing you can do without, you know, the, the light. And uh, yeah, it works out really well. So hope it works for you. And or if you have some similar idea that... Uh, is a little different love to hear about it so onward to the next thing now another thing about this book at the moment I don't have a lot of locations written in there but what's eventually going to happen obviously you'll collect this information and what I plan on doing in the near future is creating like I did with my other forms a master sort of a sheet and the initial thought that comes to me is maybe getting, excuse me, just like a little organizer book that has dividers with months. And I think that'll be a quick reference. And then on those pages, I can write location, weather, time, and I'll have a quick reference by month uh, is one quick idea that pops in my head. So that's the plan in the future is uh, once, you know, you get a ton of these things written down. Yeah, what are you, you're trying to go through each page and, you know, where's my sunny ones and, you know, because it's sunny. And I think uh, maybe you can do a dual thing, do the dividers by month and then dividers by weather. And maybe weather might be easier first because obviously you're going to uh, notice the weather first. So that might be a better idea. Anyway, that's the plan for this. Okay, now what uh, I want to go over is uh, what I do with the painting, finished painting, what it looks like, that sort of thing. Um, I used to work in the framing trade, and uh, framing can be very expensive. And uh, I'm pretty handy. I, I can get by with, uh, hold on. I can get by with some power tools. Okay. So this one frame shop I worked at, he used to have this artist that we, we uh, framed paintings for, and uh, he would get what they call a floater frame, which I'll show you in a minute if you're not familiar with it. And his were made out of cherry, actually in two parts. You had just like a piece of wood, like a piece of lathing, lathing I think they call it, very thin quarter inch 
or I mean um, three eighths of an inch, and then a square piece of wood attaches to it to create an L uh, painted black. And I'll show you again. Mine's a little different, but same idea. So it just really gave a striking look to his paintings. It's one of the things I didn't like about regular frames, especially ones that were pop, you know, still popular with the gold leaf and all that sort of thing. Well, when you have it, here's the painting, and you have that frame lip on your painting. What happens over time, especially if they exhibit a lot, it microscopic, you know, rubs or heat, cold, heat, cold. What happens? Oh, I want to, I want to take that painting out of the frame and put another one in. Well, when you take that painting out, right along that edge of the painting can potentially be flakes of, of uh, gold leaf because you varnish and it's stuck there. And unless you reframe it with another frame with a, you know, so it can be a little bit of a, a nuisance. Never mind the cost. So I learned back then to make my own floater frames. And let me show you one now. This is the original wood I used to use. This is a floater frame. And you can see this distance, this height of this is dictated by your panel you're putting in there. So if you have a quarter inch panel, that depth I always make an eighth inch higher. So that if these were leaning against one another or something, that, that little bit of spacing you know, the, the faces of the paintings won't touch. So that, that's dictated by your thickness of your, your support. And the height, this just happened to be, I had a wider plank of wood that I can buy. I bought, this is actually decking lumber, Mangaris. And I uh, bought a, a, a local hardware store and use it for planks on a deck. And I thought, well, that looks pretty nice. I can... Uh, cut it down the middle pretty much and you end up with that thickness. It just happened to aesthetically work with the size. This is a six by eight frame. And if I did a larger painting, this depth could potentially go to almost two inches. So it stays in proportion to the size of, of, of your painting. So it doesn't look too minuscule. The frame doesn't look too minuscule. So what happens is, see, this is not nice reddish. That only happens because it's usually a lighter tone like this wood. Not that color, but if you picture that like a little more warm toned, almost like this down in here, uh, or actually this right there. Uh, what happens is I make the frame. I actually do this on table saw and it's a little lengthy to explain how, but if you're interested, you know, comment, and I can try to work out a, a video to show you that technique. But once I made the frame, before I put this stain on, which I'll get to in a minute, I sand it so you don't have any gaps in the corners. And I really sand it, gets smooth, because this particular wood has a very kind of strange grain, and if you're not careful, it can be slivery, but you know, just sand it with a power sander. And then once that's done, I take tongue oil and I put it on there with a lint-free cloth. Let it set up, depending on humidity and everything. I usually do like six frames at, at a time. So by the time I get done with the sixth frame, I go back to the first frame and I buff out that first coat. And you do that two or three coats or to your liking so you get more of a sheen and glassy surface. And it, and it really hardens up nice because it's a resin. And that is nice. So here's the problem though. With the particular wood I was using, trying to find the same planks with the same tone, because I knew from experience in the past that when I put this tongue oil on, if one board's a little more brown or one's a little more red, they do look different once you got the tongue oil on. So of course you're gonna have strips of framing to use and if you don't match them up right, so it got to be a real pain. So now I'm experimenting with just getting poplar and make my frame sanding it. And now I've, I've experimented with spray paint. I just happened to, I got black spray paint, espresso, and uh, this nice caramel color. And I did that because 
if this gets too dark, you know, it doesn't work on every painting. So having some free choices. The key is, of course, dust-free area when you spray painting and different temperatures outside are going to affect the drying time. And then a light sanding in between coats to get that nice final coat. Uh, I haven't uh, had any issues yet, but the other wood is kind of harder and denser because it's a resin. So it's more resistant to abrasion you might get in the way some gallery people handle paintings. But you might get a nick. I mean, this wood's a little softer too, so you got to be, it's a touch fragile, but I'm not too worried about it. I think the paint toughens it up a bit, um, but it's nice to have that, that choice. So let me show you what I mean. I got this little painting here. I'm going to put the frame on each one of them, kind of hold it in there. So here's the darker one. Yes, it could work too, but you'll see it gives the painting different looks. So I would glue it down in there. Bigger paintings that would create a strainer, glue it to the panel and then screw it in. But these smaller ones, I just use wood glue, space it, and then glue it in there. So see that? Yeah, it's okay. But you look at also look at it from a side view, that sort of thing. Now look at the caramel, which is the one I'm going to use. I think it makes for a more beautiful look. Hold on. And you can adjust your you can adjust your channel around the painting too if you like, but I usually use about oh three sixteenths of an inch. So here's the caramel colored one. I like the tone of this a lot better. So see what I mean? So like I said, if you want, I can try to do a more in length video of uh, show you my setup for what I use for framing on my own. And I think it goes pretty quick, even though I'm not making, you know, I don't have any fancy jigs. I just, uh, I'll go down, I'll make like five frames at a time and it still is pretty quick. So and definitely very cost effective, especially if you paint a lot. So, hope you enjoyed that. Okay, something else that uh, is new that I bought is one time I went out, I was going to make this great video for you guys, and I went to this nice little area right by the river, right in Oakland nearby. Beautiful weather, light was coming in in the morning, kind of raking up. Uh, foreground trees were in shadow. I mean, it was just beautiful. And I had my little tarp set up with my hammock, really relaxing. Then I go to start the video, and at the time I was using my Kindle, and no power. I didn't realize my battery went dead. Usually I'm pretty good about checking the night before because I know I'm going to go out. So, and the painting ended up being pretty nice. And, uh, Hold on, I'll show it to you. Okay, so here's here's the painting. I'll be doing another coat on it, brightening up just a few things, but it came out pretty nice. And I sure wish that video could have happened because it, it was a really fun time. So to avoid that problem in the future, I went out and I bought these little power banks, I think they're called. And you get different size ones. I don't know. There's something to do with the hertz, the way it, how fast it charges up. I'm not really sure. But so these are a PNY brand. Get them at an office supply store. And got a little two pack of these for $15. And it comes, it comes with a little cable to charge your, your smartphone, a little micro kind of deal. And uh Got the USB port in there. So they work great. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if this can charge, because now I'm shooting on an iPad. Of course, um, I don't like the idea of taking my charging cord, my only charging cord, and maybe I'm out camping or whatever, and I lose the cord, and then that's a pain. So I just bought an extra one to keep with this. Each one, I'll have this for my iPad. And the other one I'll keep uh, handy in case, you know, phone or just have two power things. If I'm out camping for a week, not near a source of uh, power, it'll be handy 
to, uh, to use. And these things, uh, from what I'm told, and I've heard stories, they stay, once you charge them, they stay charged for a very long time until, you, of course, you use them. But um, so, because I, I thought, oh, what if I let this sit around for a month? And then is it going to be drained out before I even use it? Well, no, they work. So I'm really happy to, to uh, get that, and uh, I won't have that issue of uh, dead battery anymore. So highly recommend it. Um, who would have thought? I just hadn't thought of those before, and because uh, normally I charge things up. So hope that helps also. So something else I do periodically, because it's kind of fun, is I'll pick out some different primary or doesn't have to be primary uh, colors but whatever it's very limited palette and I'll just do a little sample painting from the head using only that palette that I've put there above to see what tones I get that's possible out of that color now yes you can go ahead and create like an actual color chart and, and do strips of color I've done those before too but you can see I'm talking about and uh, yeah a lot of fun I highly recommend it well, that concludes this video on how I work in my studio what I do to document my artwork and uh, I hope you found it useful uh, actually not sure if this can be one video com complete depending on how long the clips are uh, hope you didn't find it too boring uh, just thought it'd be useful and I'd love to hear your comments on uh, what you may do uh, in your studio and till next time the still life box you saw in the other room earlier in the video uh, yeah, I'm looking to go to the store today pick up some uh, fall type things uh, look for some gourds small pumpkins and do a little fall still life and uh, that'll be the next video so that's what I'm hoping again thanks for watching and I appreciate everyone that's made comments on my videos it means a lot to me and uh, thank you for subscribing if you're not a subscriber uh, if you like the video please subscribe and to get more information and knowledge and talk to you soon bye